I'm your host, Damon Epps. I am here with Colin Kendrick, the CEO and founder, one of the founders of Sonic Guild, whose mission is to make local music, no, is to support local music, much like the Symphony in the Orchestra. You got it. And we have chapters in Austin, Seattle, Denver, Denver and now Denver. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So we started, you know, we're a, we're a 501c3 charity headquartered in Austin. We expanded chapters into Seattle and Denver and now the Ozarks. Our mission is to help artists create and perform new music. You founded Sonic Guild and you had this mission to help local artists because local artists, obviously, local artists, musicians and you know, music business is a, it's a, it's a hard business. It's more so, than a hard business. Like I, I grew up in Austin, Texas, so I've been around live music my whole life. Um, when you get to know the artists and see how they're living, they sacrifice a lot to pursue a career in music, a lot. Uh, and then the, the general state of the music industry is adjusted for inflation. You know, the music industry peaked in 1994 with CD sales. Uh, the total revenue has only just now started to go up in the last couple of years. And so it's it's a much smaller pie, and it's being divided in more ways than in new ways. Right. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I'm in the TV business, and obviously less and less people are watching television. Um, and I think the, like, the access of music has just changed because you can get music anywhere, every yep. everywhere. And so... And people are starting to produce their own stuff, which is great for artists to be able to do that. What made you, what was like the the, the moment in which you were like, I want to create a, uh, a charity foundation um, to help musicians? So I finished my undergraduate degree at the University of Texas in Austin in radio, tele television, and film. Um, I was working at the TV show Austin City Limits. I was an intern setting up mics and dragging cables, pushing the record button. Uh and uh, I was there when they were losing Frito-Lay as their large corporate sponsor, and they were, they were having significant financial problems. Um, and um, they had an incredible vault of content that they'd recorded over 20, 30 years, but the contracts they'd signed meant that they could not use it very well in monetization. So they, didn't, they had all these assets and no way to create revenue from it. Um, and so I was looking at their model and their challenges, uh, and I sort of thought, well, why isn't there a symphony or an opera for the kind of music I'm passionate about? Uh, so I knew my friends needed the help. I saw the financial model at a major institution that served industry musicians, and I started thinking about, well, how do we how do we solve this problem? So interesting. So you, so you you actually saw the model that was helping. Oh, this w was a model that would help the TV studio, right? Or or are you saying that you saw the model for the symphony and the orchestra? I. I saw them, their model was to put national emerging or established talent on television and distribute through PBS. Okay, got it. Right. Um, a nonprofit entity creating content, just like so many of the NPR stations around the world are doing, right? Um, that inspired me to start thinking about financial models for supporting musicians, and in particular the musicians I could see were really, really struggling. Uh, that was the catalyst. Do you remember um, who was the first art? Like, how did you get things started? I mean, Austin is a very cool city, obviously. Austin's had a lot of changes. Austin's changed in a big way now. Yes. Um, so you were born and raised in Austin. Not born, but I got there before I turned one, and I'm okay. 54 now. So I've, I've lived in Austin a long, long time. Um, what was it about, like, uh, Austin obviously has it. I guess t tell me about the Austin music scene and why that was so important to you and like where. Yeah, I mean, music's been my passion. Uh, I joke that I'm like Steve Martin in the opening scene of The Jerk, where he's on the front porch trying to clap with rhythm and can't. Right, so I I just didn't think I had any ability to create music, uh, and I was much better at business and math and contracts, and so. I brought what I could to the table. Um, you know, seeing seeing that was the sort of ability assessment, but but the reality there was, you know, some of the musicians I were hanging out with were serious drug and alcohol issues. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, you know, they're touring 
200 nights a year on the road. So not any ability to have strong relationships, right. certainly not children. Um, and living paycheck to paycheck, uh, an economy that is largely tip driven or ticket sales driven. So no predictable income, unsecure family and around drugs and alcohol all the time. And in an industry where fans reward you for your art by buying you drinks. Right. Right. Rather than paying you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's just a landscape fraught with danger for creative people. Yeah. I mean, I did stand up for a long time and that's part of the, um, one of the reasons why I didn't want to do that as a career, unfortunately, was the lifestyle was just, it was too lonely. I mean, even producing television, you go out for, you know, know, months at a time, but you're with at least, you know, whether it's, 10 people or 200 people on a show you have a little group you know when you're a you're a comic you're just by yourself on the road doing just you know you're, it's just a lonely lonely life and sure when you get famous then it looks really great but you know when you're struggling and you're just going from little crappy casino is the big thing and then you know you're doing like the little terrible little hotels along yeah. the way just to pick up a little paycheck um have you seen that environment changing as the years go by? And I mean, obviously musicians party a lot, so I guess it's always kind of an element, but. There's a real disconnect between the, the public or the consumer view of what it's like to be a musician, right? It, it looks like fame and glory and, you know, groupies, right? Um, the reality is the North American music industry uh, is only distributing about a billion to a billion and a half dollars a year to musicians that are not in the 0.01% of bands. So if you are not a major touring act, you're competing for a billion dollar market. The billion dollar market will employ 10,000 people. L- local musicians are killing each other because there's just a lot of them and a lot of them are talented. And the industry is not has never figured out how to support them. And, and the economics of the music, I used to, I grew up in the 80s, right? So indie was indie then. And it mm-hmm. was very much an anti-music industry stance. Because it's an industry, you know, that looks pretty rough on the outside uh, in terms of how labels pick people up and drop them, right? But the reality there is that the way the music industry is structured, they have a system now that for every thousand bands a label invests in, five break even and one turns a profit. Because of that, that's, that's like 10x the risk of venture capital at a much smaller dollar level with a much lower financial return. So in order to recoup and make that model work, they had to sign seven album 360 deals. Otherwise, math didn't work, right? And so what we're bringing, I think, is something the music industry has never had, which is a purely philanthropic, deeply local catalyst of community to support local music and to take pride in it and to celebrate it and to get the best of each of these great cities and their their sound everyone's got a unique sound Mm -hmm. get it out on the road and in front of the world uh, and then to get those artists in those cities connecting and working together right the only way you make a sustainable difference in a musician's long-term health is to create uh, to accelerate time to audience to grow fans Right. right now, a band from Seattle that wants to get into Austin spends two, three years saving money, flying down, playing to five people, six months later to 20 people. They have to build a fan base. Um, and by doing an artist exchange where a band from Seattle can exchange with a band from Austin that can pack a room, first time that Seattle band walks into Austin, they're playing to 500 people. Got it. Right. And so it's these... No individual music city has the ability to save their own population. The resources are just not there. Oh, I see what you're saying. So it's hard for a, a local band to go and play in another city because... Touring is its not practical very much anymore. Merch sales used to support bands and... That doesn't happen. Right. It's just not... It's, it, it's, it works, but it works for one out of 100. And it Got leaves it. a lot of very deep talent on the road behind it. Um. So there's an opportunity to build something that's never existed in the music industry. We, we compare it to a, a, a minor league of music, this idea that we can have you know, farm teams of incredible musicians that are receiving grants and investment capital from us and mentoring and education, 
and and put them on the road into all these other cities where they play to larger audiences much faster. Um, and it becomes, you know, if you're in the industry or you're a band wanting to be in the industry, you know, you gain visibility, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we reduce risk for the record label because they used to invest in artist development right. and touring. They do less of that these days because TikTok has filled that gap, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, TikTok's creating some great breakouts, but those are, <laughs> it's so funny, like some of those bands have never played in front of an audience. Like they make a great video in their living room that there's literally not a band. There are two people that have written a catchy song. Right. And then the label has to go in and build a band around them, teach them how to tour, get them on the road, right? We have a much more organic model, which is designed on building a community through which people rise up, receive the resources they need and the coaching they need, and then, and then can go on to the next stage of their life, whether that's with a record label or there's an old thousand true fans model, which is the idea if you have just a thousand fans in the U.S. and each of them is giving you $100 a year, that's a good job, right? Uh, and so there are all these different paths for a local musician to make a living, but it's not clear. Yeah, it sounds, yeah, it's tough. It's tough to, the creative world is a tough world. Um, what was the first start? Like, who was the first band? Like, if you, has there been like a breakout success? Uh, I wouldn't take credit for that, for sure. Right. Um, the musicians that Sonic Guild is addressing uh, are bands that have been performing generally in and around Austin or on the road for years, right? They've just kind of reached this point in their career where they're ready to go to the next level and the capital's not there. Banks won't lend them money. Um, but our system identifies those artists and, and gets them on the stage in front of our patrons much earlier in their career, right? So of the 250 or so bands we've distributed grants to, three have gone on to get Grammy nominations. Okay. Uh, one just finished producing an album with Dan Arbach of the Black Keys, uh, and that same cat spun around and is now opening for Billy Joel at Hyde Park Stadium in London. That's right? great. Um, so we're helping, right? They're doing the hard work, but we're providing resources. And I know this already, What's the percentage of, like, from investment that goes back into the community? I mean, obviously, you have to, you know, there's a piece of it that has to run the machine behind it. And yeah. then and then, give me the numbers of how much money you've given out to artists. And it's, when did this the whole thing start? Started in twenty December 2012. We had our first gathering of patrons. Okay. Uh, we didn't catalyze it in an organization until March of March the next year. So it took us a while to get to our first 100 members. That enabled us to give away $100,000 in grants. Oh, wow. Right. So it was a real amount of money very quickly. Um, yeah. Sorry, I lost the question. No, no, it's no, it's, it's totally fine. Um, oh, the, so the efficiency yeah. of them. Look, <laughs> I wish I could play music. I'm not very good at that. I'm great at financial models and starting companies and building businesses. And we're you know, we're 10 years in on this, and we worked the first seven years. We did it all volunteer. Nobody was paid, right? Um, For how many years? Seven. Seven years. Nobody got paid. Nobody. And this was my second music nonprofit, and the other one's been around for 20-plus years. So I've been, you know, I and a core group of my friends and, and colleagues have been throwing their backs into making this model happen, and it's happening. It's succeeding, right? So we're not at scale. We're nowhere near at scale. And 76% of every dollar through the door is being distributed to local musicians or local music businesses. Um, <clears throat> members are at the core of that. For every dollar a member contributes, we're distributing a dollar and 28 cents to a band, directly to a band, right? So if you're a patron walking through the door of one of our shows, you're going to that show and still 100 and 30% of every dollar you give us is going to a musician. How is it like 130%? How does that matter? Because we, we pull in corporate sponsors to help oh, offset it. the cost of events, right? We pull in grants, right? We, we're raising our, our revenue is distributed across all of the different types of revenue pretty, pretty well. Like our membership is about 35%, and that's the largest percent of our revenue or income. Okay. So then, so, okay, gotcha. Because so there's it was a like lot of sources of income. That's very cool. I know that, you know, some of these artists that you're, well, why, let's, let's just go into why Bentonville. Like why, what, what, 
well, I mean, obviously, everyone talks about how Bentonville is going to be the next Austin. Um, yeah. I used to, you know, I, I used to go to Austin. And it was a much smaller city. People forget that it used to be a small little town with, you know, just 6th Street. And yep. um, now they look like, look, Bentonville will never be Austin. I'm like, don't kid yourself. I mean, it could be, it's definitely going to be something. Um, That's part of the reason I want to be here, right? Austin's gotten challenging for musicians. To, to stay in, right? We're losing musicians. They're moving away. Some, some, a lot more are moving in, but, but Bentonville is is what the city has done with the support of the Walton Family Foundation and others um, is amazing. Like the the level of thought that's going into city planning and growth and arts and attraction and tourism and industry and startups. It, there's a lot of very smart decisions being made in this town. Uh, and if I can drive the level of engagement I'm hoping to here, we have the ability to get ahead of that challenge for artists uh, in a way that could be really meaningful. And, and in particular, because Bentonville, if you, if you look at the map of the United States, um, Bentonville is sort of the positioned like the Chicago of the South, right? Mm -hmm. It's in the middle of everything. And flights from here go to every one of the major music cities that are, you know, straight to Seattle, straight to Denver, Straight to Atlanta, straight to Nashville, straight to Austin. Like, if you are a musician and using Bentonville as a hub, and you're touring 200 nights a year, this place is great. There's a low cost of living just outside of the city limits. Mm -hmm. um, you can buy a home. And by this way, the city limits are not large. Right. Like the city, no. it's a three mile city limit. Or it's growing fast. Oh right? yeah, for sure, 100. percent I mean, there's different Rogers and all that kind of stuff, but there's, you know, you compare this to like a. A city, city. It's yeah. Cities are the little towns are, yeah. Yeah. I mean, to to me, the the question here is: as Bentonville develops uh, as a music destination for tourism, does does Bentonville want to be Aspen or does it want to be Austin? Right? Is it is it going to be a place that has only large venues and only imports major touring acts? Or is it going to have a population of local musicians that are talented, supported, plugged into the industry, know what it takes to kill a show in Austin and can deliver that same level of performance here mm -hmm. um, and, and build a community? And that's what we do. We build communities. We pull in corporate sponsors and individual donors and grants from institutional money, and we build a community. And our events are special. Like, our events are small. The vast majority of our smalls are our shows are under 200 people and we're doing almost a hundred shows a year now in the United States with eight employees. That's wow. crazy, right? That's crazy. Yeah. So, um, if Bentonville is going to have local businesses, bars, clubs, restaurants that want live music as a component of their offering, they need local musicians. Mm-hmm. Or, or, or musicians that are looking to grow their audience quickly in a, on the road. Uh, and we would create a catalyst and a magnet for that community. And, and because we don't own buildings, we don't own recording studios, we deliberately don't compete with for-profit business, we enable all those businesses to turn a profit. Right? We will pay a band to perform at a local venue. We'll bring our members in early, private show, 7 to 9, 7 to 10, turn the keys over to the venue. They've already made their nut for the night in the first three hours of the day. And they got the rest of the night to entertain people. That's great. And a world-class band in the space. Yeah. It must like help also just once you build the machine, you're almost making um, like if, if younger kids can see that they could be a musician, right. then you're kind of, I guess, you know, developing the ecosystem that where dreams are possible, you know, when, you know, like nobody believes you can really be an actor, but you live in LA, you realize, oh, it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice, a lot of dedication. The process. And a process to yeah. do it. You know, uh, somebody will call me every once in a while and they're like, hey, you know, I'm an actor. I live in so, I'm like, you know, the first step, I'm like, you gotta move to Los Angeles. I mean, you gotta, you gotta make the sacrifice. You can't just, you know, if you just wanna do local theater, it's totally fine. But if you want to make the, the step to be a professional actor or, you know, really be in the, you gotta, you gotta do it. You can't just say you're going to do it. Um, and you got to go where the machine is. So it's very cool that you're building these machines. Yeah, it's working. 
we, we have a very big vision here. You know, we're, we're hoping to be in 20 plus of the biggest, most popular music cities in the United States within the next five to 10 years, right? We begin to have a scale at that point that can really impact our musicians and can, you know, it's, it's fun to get, if you're a member, you're, you're like instantly plugged into the music scene. Like you, you get to meet the artists, know the artists. We, we do events in all kinds of strange, cool places. Um, yeah, I think, it, it, why don't you just tell me, because I mean, I know this, Tell me how the structure works. Like, tell member? me, th- yeah, the member stru- structure. We uh, we charge seven hundred and fifty dollars a year in annual dues. Um, that's eligible for corporate match by a lot of major employers, which can cut that price, you know, by thirty or forty percent. Uh, in return for your dues, you get invited to private member only shows about once a month. Uh, in Austin, we're now large enough where we're doing forty of those a year. Um, and then you participate in an annual artist selection process. So we, we provide our grants on a community-selected basis. And so our members get to nominate and vote for bands to get grants from us. All of our prior artists we've funded get to vote and nominate. Uh, industry advisors, we're 40-plus strong in Austin of people that live and work in the music industry that own venues. They participate in the artist selection process. And so... That in Austin, that generates a list of you know 500 plus bands a year that people are putting forward. Uh, we stack rank them, we sort through it, we create a playlist of 100. Three months later, everybody votes. Uh, we pick 20 bands and and they hold a whole season of shows, these private shows. Uh, and at the end of that, we have a gala event and everybody has voted and, and sort of said every every one of those 20 artists who were invited get a grant because they're great. The system just the bands that are coming up through that are world class. We funded eighty plus percentage of the Austin Chronicles' best new bands in the last ten years. Wow! So we're it, it works, and um, so you're participating in the selection of artists. You're allocating money. You're doing that alongside the arts community, but musicians themselves. Um, and then those grants are distributed, and then and the artist that receives those grants then it has access to an advisory board. Again, in Austin, that's people that have, you know, toured with Beyonce and produced records for Pearl Jam. And, I mean, it's a world-class group of industry folk uh, that can help those artists make decisions about how to allocate that money and move it around, right? Um, I don't think I answered your question, did No, I, you totally answered my question. Uh, it's it, the member experience, right? Yeah. You join. It ends up costing you roughly 50 bucks a month. You're getting at least one show a month for that, and then you're participating in a community-driven philanthropic process that awards grants to artists. Well, I think it's very cool that you came. I mean, obviously, we met, I guess it's been a year now. Um, it's very cool that you're here, and I've said this on every show, and I say that on every show, but two years ago is, you know, like I feel like there's so much talent that is starting to move to this town, um, including bit kind of what you said, like incredible business, like, men like in music departments or you know film producers yeah. that are all kind of moving here they're all kind of a little hush hush but they're all moving away from their big city places and they're trying to find the next little cool destination and you know austin's a very cool place but it's definitely lost a little bit it's like i remember when it's like let's keep austin weird and i feel like austin has lost it's a little bit of it's weird it's, it hasn't it's just gone underground it's just okay that's true it's, it's lost it's i guess it's lost it's from it's where it was before the, like the, the there's rainies. a lot of people that are unplugged. A lot and, of people are unplugged. Yeah, because because right now you know it, it costs you forty dollars and thirty minutes to get to downtown and yeah. park for an evening. That's what I mean. That's a pretty significant barrier. Yeah, it's a it's a real city now. It's San Francisco. Yeah. It's L A. It's you know you you get a parking ticket, you lose your house. Um, it's, <laughs> it's you know I always loved L A. It was like you get one parking ticket, it's like two hundred dollars, and you're like, and then you can't pay your rent, and then you're on the streets. It's like it's terrible. You're um, scarred. You're scarred for life. I'm scarred for life. When I was such a young guy. I just was like, I was out there and I just got one parking ticket. I was like, oh my God, my world's going to die if I get another parking ticket. Um, yeah, it's um, like Rainy Street. It's just such a bummer. And I still love Austin. Austin's very cool. The food is great. The musicians are incredible. So, I mean, it's still an incredible place. Um, I'm hoping to see that kind of growth here. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to see. There's not a lot of music. In this, well, I mean, everything's being built right now. There was only, I mean, That's we've right. already doubled the amount of restaurants since 
two years ago. Yeah. Um, venues are coming. Um, I'm larger hoping venues. Larger right? venues are coming. Yeah, I, I don't have any visibility into like the smaller clubs, right? Um, that's the part of the ecosystem I think we can help address, right? I mean, people come here for weeks to ride bikes and be here, but Tuesday night, Wednesday night in this town, not much going on. Uh, lots of great restaurants, right? But it ends at nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, we can bring world class musicians here. We can raise up world class musicians that are here to to provide something the city doesn't have. How much money have you given away? Three point seven million to artists, and uh, did my math one point eight million to local music businesses for a total of five point six million. Wow! Uh, by the end of the year, that'll that'll be mid six million. So we did a million dollars just last year in 2022. Really? Yeah. A million dollars? Yeah. I mean, 80. It's this is an interesting perspective on this, right? So North American music industry distributes about 1.5 billion dollars a year to local artists. Symphonies and operas all across the country are running about two billion dollars a year in revenue, and our model is 75 to 80 percent of that is distributed to the local music economy. Like, if you could channel the energy that's flowing into symphonies and operas and channel it into local music, mm -hmm. uh, you can revolutionize the music industry. You can make it possible for the top 3% or 5% of bands to make a living doing what they're doing. Um, we're, we're chasing a renaissance in local music. It's so, it, it's, when you did that pitch to me the first time, I just had never thought about I think the nonprofit world has been fascinating to me because I just, I'm just a guy that doesn't really like to ask for money. And, um, but it's, it's, it's interesting of like, it's so right there. Like, why aren't we supporting local music? Like, because the symphony is local. I mean, and the orchestra is local. Um, they're obviously very talented musicians. I actually like classical music. I do too. Um, but why, but why aren't we? I mean, it's such a, it was such a, Great idea, and it's obviously just something that, you, that you're that you taking on your back, but we should be supporting local artists just the same way as we support. Why wouldn't we? We like the music, right? right. And we want it to be there. Um, you know, what's happened is is the, the demographics have shifted. The baby boomers have grown older, right? And so the symphonies, and I don't wish will on symphonies and operas, but their audience is aging out, mm -hmm. uh, and they're not being backfilled by younger donors. And so we're trying to move into that vacuum. Oh, that's interesting. So they're suffering my like the same world as this TV world. Everybody's every everything is changing. I think it's a and taste is changing, right? So yep. I, I look at my father. He only, he's only, he's eighty five. He only listens to classical music. His brother, who's eighty one, listens to everything. Right? Grew up on rock and roll, and you know isn't afraid to listen to hip hop and rap. And like he, you know, he loves music, and it and he's used to going out. Interesting. What made you so, what made you fall in love with music? Was there a specific thing that made you? Was there a specific artist that you've? <laughs> I, I'm a hard, I'm a pretty intense introvert, right? You know this. Yep. You're, you're not. And so, I am not. And I appreciate you. I would like to think I am sometimes, I just because I'm not, just because, but I'm not, yes. Yeah, well, I, I admire you and consider you a friend because okay. you see me for who I am and you, you lend your strength to me and I appreciate that. Like, that's big. Oh, thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. I'll take yeah. it. Um, so I'm an introvert, and, and for me, you know, high school was wonderful and risky and full of life, right? But I was an introvert, so I didn't connect very well with people, and music was my avenue to understand that, right? So I explored emotions and relationships through music, um, and it connected me to the world uh, and got me in a lot of trouble, <laughs> but but okay. damn good trouble, right? Um and so, yeah, that's, I mean, very early on, I knew music was a very, very important component of my life. And I think a lot of people are like that, right? Different people have different things. They're culinary. They like movies. They like music. Not everybody gets what we're working on, right? But if you like music and you want to be part of a community that loves music and supports it, that's us. Who, who are your artists? Who are, who are your favorite bands way back in the day? Oh, God. I mean, a lot of them were local, right? So... I don't even know if I can say some of the names anymore, but I grew up on 
bands uh, a little bit on the edge of the post-punk career the, okay. in Austin, Texas. So a bunch of local bands like Zeitgeist. The bigger ones were, you know, obviously um, Sleep at the Wheel and Guy Forsyth and, you know, not a lot of them are huge household names. Stevie Ray Vaughan was in there. We caught him a couple yeah. times at Antone's early on. Um, but Austin sort of has never had its moment in the sun like Seattle. Right. Uh, Austin is quirky enough. They didn't have their nirvana. We didn't have enough concentration of any one genre of music because we have them all. Any sure. night of the week in Austin, there, there are a hundred live stages. You know, Austin gets guffed sometimes for calling itself the live music capital of the world. But I've now been to a bunch of major music cities, and Austin's Austin's doing more, right? And Austin just this year started distributing three point five million dollars to local musicians to help them remain in market. Oh, yeah. city of Austin did that. It's taken them forty years, but they just realized people are leaving. It's so expensive now. Yeah, um, and it's an asset, right? It's a cultural asset in Austin. Uh, music generates one point eight billion dollars a year in revenue for the city, in tax revenue for the city. You can't, you can't, yeah, you got to water the roots of that tree. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, it's a big the, business. The business side of things is well, and that's frankly part of what's here, right? The city is growing rapidly, um, and there are needs of the community that are not being met. There's always something going on here. Always, always. Um, but it's not a lot of live music. There's definitely not a lot of live music. Certainly not in a small venue format, right? You have to be willing to go to festivals and coliseums. It's funny. I've I when I was younger and I used to go to South by Southwest. I told you the story the other day. But we all had fake IDs. We walk into that little bar and there was like two people in there, and there was probably four of us with fake IDs going in there and getting purple hooter shots or whatever they were. Um, <laughs> Cause you could do fake IDs in Texas way back in the day. Um, and I looked on stage and Metallica and Willie Nelson were playing. Yeah. Right. And that was a moment where, I mean, Austin was still a town, right? Southwest, South by Southwest wasn't sponsored by Coca-Cola and all this big stuff yet. It was really just a town where any kind of artists from all different types of the world and Metallica was, they were super famous, but they weren't what they are today. They weren't, I mean, well, not today, but they weren't like the biggest, hugest band in the world. I'm sure Metallica was freaking out that they were able to play with Willie Nelson more than Willie Nelson would be like, oh my God, you know? Um, but then then again, it might have been the Ride the Lightning was probably happening right. and all of that was going I think on. Willie just likes making music. Right? Willie is just a, yeah, he <laughs> Willie is Willie. Everybody loves that guy. Him and yeah, Snoop right. Dogg are just the most fascinating people in the world. Yeah. Um, but that was just a really cool time to see that kind of music growth, I guess, in Austin. Um, to see that kind of... I hope that this kind of can start sparking that kind of engagement to where we start seeing some of the big artists kind of come here, which I feel like is happening because, you know, you come to Blake Street and this place is amazing. Well, and, and the they, amp. They're booking major touring acts into yep. the amp, right? But what you're missing is small, intimate, you know shows where you get to interact with the people that are there, right? There's no community around it. Maybe there is. Maybe I don't know. But, um, you know, the bands we brought in to Bentonville, you know, one of them is a Grammy Award winning, or sorry, Grammy nominated, one of them is a Grammy nominated bluegrass musician, you know. Four of them have been picked up to play at Format Festival, the big festival that's coming up oh, that's, here, yeah, right? So that's there's in just a couple of weeks. You know, we're spotting talent a little bit ahead of Format Festival. Um, you know, the fellow I told you about who produced his next album with Dan Arbach from the Black Keys and now is playing for Billy Joel. Like, there's definitely a portion of the musicians we're connecting with that are on that trajectory. Who are the bands that are playing at Format Fest? You remember the bands from that we've helped uh -huh. uh, past lives are returning for their second show at format festival. Um, the local band uh, out of Fayetteville modeling uh, has been picked up. So I think C3 and, and whoever the powers that be here are, are beginning to recognize local talent as part of that equation. What do you see the future of Sonic Guild going even locally? If you want to go there. Our first hurdle locally is, is is getting 200 members signed up, right? We've got about half that 
either signed up or pledged at this point. Um, so you have 100 members right now? We have 20 paid, and we have 76 that have said they're going to pay, but we have to go convert them. And we just we just started. We, we always try to get to about 100 members before we catalyze a chapter. Okay. Right? Because uh, before you hit that point, there's sort of risks to sustainability. And the last thing I want to do is come in the door here and make a lot of promises and not deliver on them. Mm-hmm. Right? And so... We need to get that number fully mature. At, at about 200 members here, we're self-sustaining, right? That That's an entity that's giving away fifty to $100,000 a year in grants to local artists. It's holding 12-plus live shows and, and has staff, a staff, right? And so that's sustainable. Scalable, it's been really interesting since, since the Waltons, uh, Walton Family Foundation um, funded us, uh, We've picked up major arts funders in Texas and in Washington, right? So uh, the stamp of approval from the Walton Family Foundation, Foundation Walton Family Foundation, meant that um, we were able to raise more institutional dollars in other places and, and you know, with six figures, right? And so uh, my hope is that I can help Bentonville understand that by creating this here, it's not big. It's very small. The number of people that are involved. It's that we're not focused on audience because we don't want to compete with the local venues that are. Right? We're about patronage. We're small shows, but we focus on generating margin dollars to invest back into the community. Right. Um, my hope is that that we're quickly moving into Tulsa and Kansas City on the path to Chicago and up to Minneapolis. Right, and from Seattle down to Portland. It's kind of what I hope is the immediate roadmap. That would give me eight chapters uh, and a nice, you know, semicircular tour route to I, engage artists. I was just about to say that. So, so the the ultimate goal is to almost create a. Um, <laughs> I always think of my old stand-up days, but you know, we used to do this really terrible comedy run called the Tribble Run. Um, what up, Tribble? What up, Dave Tribble? Um, but it was like, it was one of the, like, you know, it was just like, it was basically through, like we go, we start in California, go all the way through Washington, Oregon, and then kind of come back down. And it was just this little run you did. And you would just like do all these little venues and kind of whatever. So you're trying to connect all the cities. So then to kind of what you were saying earlier is that the bigger band that's in Seattle will either, they'll, they'll, they'll play together, I guess. And we'll, then we'll build- create grants that- provide financial incentive for a band in Seattle to invite an Austin band they like to come up there to open for them and do an exchange, right? And so we provide, we cover cost of travel and things like that. We facilitate oh, God, that it, That's what you meant by exchange. I think I forget, I didn't, I kind of lost that. I was, for some yeah. reason I was like, they're exchanging houses? But no, so you're exchanging no. stage time and audiences. So you're, exchange, right. you're, so you're exchanging your audience wealth. That's right. And from the perspective of Bentonville, that means every new chapter we open anywhere in the United States, and, and most of these are large music cities, right? Nashville, Atlanta. Um, we can bring those artists here, and we can marry them up with local talent and, and provide local talent with access to resources to get out on the road and into those major music cities, right? So, so I think from the perspective of a member here, um, you know, it's, it, you like live music? want to see it once, twice a month, we're going to be bringing really amazing, accessible acts, people you can engage with and talk with and understand their art and see them in a small room with your friends. And, and we do all our shows. All our shows are doors at 7, first band at 8, second band at 9. We tend to wrap up by 1030. Uh, it's early. It's accessible. Um, it's a listening room, so we... The rule is when uh, the music starts, when the song starts, the talking stops, right? So you can yell and chat with your friends all you want between songs, but we're respectful of the artist, and that's the experience we deliver. Um, so I see opportunity here, both in terms of catalyzing the community around the local talent and in, in creating a sustainable tour route at the national level. You know, from a perspective of a band, if you have three or four anchor dates in a major city where you're going to have a good audience turnout, that routing becomes sustainable and you can begin to branch out into other markets that are adjacent to that. Um, and so we're, we're going to create a brand behind the artists we're funding. 250 amazing bands have already been through our program. Um, and we 
hope that the reputation of the organization is such that it, it's a vehicle for music discovery, right? Like, you've seen how many of our bands now? Oh, the, yeah. I mean, what? I, I don't even know. 10, 12? And they're, they're great. I'm super excited about this whole Sonic Guild thing coming together here in Bentonville. Our, our official model is, uh, or, sorry, our official uh, motto is patrons of local music. So it sums up what we do in our secret It's We do cool shit. You do do cool shit. <laughs> And I thank you for coming on the Good Time Show. Thank you for having me, man. Thanks for being a friend. friend. Exactly. All right, guys. Thank you for the good times. Well, that's our show. If you didn't get a chance to watch the episode, check it out on YouTube and Spotify. You can also listen to the Good Time Show on Apple Podcasts or any other platform. We are always trying to grow our Planet Good Times community, so subscribe and follow us at Good Times Us on almost all social media platforms. This episode was presented and recorded live at Blake Street House Sound Lounge in Bentonville, Arkansas, a social club where people from all walks of life come together just to be themselves and make the community a better place. Till next time, good times, everybody.